Well, last week we began a new series called Undeniable, and uh, we're going to dive back into that this morning. Um, if you are new with us, we're so glad to have you with us, and maybe you're following us online today for the first time. We're glad to have you join us um, online as well. As we talk about this series, Undeniable, we, we talked last week about how God's presence in our lives, if we are followers of Christ, is, is really undeniable. It should be really undeniable to those who are around us. And this morning, I want to continue to talk about our undeniable God and our perspective in Christ. And you know, as we think about the greatness of God and our perspective on life being through the lens of of our hope in Christ, I, I want to address some concerns that many have with the coronavirus. I mean, we, we, uh, we didn't plan this whole series out uh, weeks ago thinking that there was going to be something major happening. Um, we, we put this series together, and, uh, and even this, this title, I knew, um, I knew we were going to be continuing with, with per- perspective again this week. And isn't it just neat how God orchestrates things? I mean, what a perfect time for us to talk about how God's presence is undeniable and how when we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, our perspective on everything around us is entirely different. The timing is something that only God could do. And and so I am so thankful for the opportunity we have to really dive into this subject matter today. And uh, we're going to do things a little bit different than we normally do. You've probably already figured that out because we're not singing right now. Um, and we're into the, the message a little bit earlier. But even the message today, I want to address some concerns that individuals have. Uh, I want to be able to give us perspective as far as moving forward. And, and we're going to spend a little bit of time c- connecting all of this with First Peter as, as well. You know, nothing, nothing that has happened in recent days and weeks and nothing that will happen in the days ahead will surprise God. Nothing is surprising to God. It, it, it is not surprising to Him. He's sovereign, meaning God is in control. And even if things do get more out of control than they may already seem, listen, God is on the throne it says this in Psalm 103:19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. All. As, as followers of Jesus Christ, we have a biblical view that, that applies to everything. And what we know is this: God is on the throne. God is sovereign. And listen, worry, worry doesn't help. Proverbs 24.10 says this, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Our strength is not in ourselves, right? As followers of Christ, we lean on God and His strength. And in our weakness, His strength comes through us. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talks about uh, both worry and prayer. And, And hear me on this, worry leads to panic, But prayer leads to peace. Jesus says in the end of Matthew chapter 6, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? Today's got enough issues in and of itself. We don't need to worry about tomorrow. We're going to focus on what we have today. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious. Pray. 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 So what do we know? God is sovereign. And worry never helps. And what do we do? We trust God fully. Because He's sovereign, because He's in control, we trust Him fully. And we love others selflessly. Let me tell you something, church. I think we have 
I think we have a great opportunity that lies before us. And as we consider our perspective and our reaction to what happens uh, around us, we need to come back to our values. We, we have three values in our church, and values define what is important. And it helps define what is important so that it shapes your behavior. It, it shapes how you respond and how you react to things. Our first value is that we value God's Word. Therefore, we seek to know, live, and proclaim the gospel. Listen, if we value God's Word, catch this, nothing should shape your perspective more than God's Word. Nothing in the days ahead should shape your perspective more than God's Word. In this value that, of God's Word that we seek to know, live, and proclaim the gospel, the word gospel means good news. How many people think that people could use a little bit of good news right now, right? Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. People are scared. They're scared. They're worried. They're concerned. And we have the greatest news of all that there is hope in Jesus. The good news is that no matter what happens moving forward, our God reigns. Jesus Christ is on the throne. He's defeated sin and death at the cross, and he's proved his power and his victory by rising from the dead. As we already noted earlier in, in our study in 1 Peter, Jesus Christ is our living hope. He's our living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we have a confident expectation that Jesus is coming back for his followers, and we have the hope that people are looking for and people need. So as we think about our perspective, first of all, we value God's word and that should shape us, shape our perspective more than anything. Our second value as a church is this, that we value others. Therefore, we seek to model the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is this. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Boy, could those things be used right about now, right? If you don't believe me, just go to a store, all right? Love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, right? I mean, right? We need to model these things. And, and as we model these characteristics and attributes, others will see Christ through us. They'll see hope. They'll see a peace that passes all understanding because of Christ in us. We value others as a church. And we need to, in light of what might possibly, might possibly get more difficult, we need to plan on loving others selflessly. Listen, if, if things get tough, we will not run and hide. We will run to help. Because that's what followers of Christ do. That's what Christians do. Study church history and see how followers of Christ respond to times of adversity. When there are plagues and pandemics, it's Christians who show that Jesus is the light of the world. And it's in these moments that our actions will speak way louder than words. We value others. If people are sick and hurting, and if you have a good immune system, I hope that you take the opportunity to help those around you. If you have people around you, if you have neighbors that are out of toilet paper, I hope you share a few rolls with them, all right? All right? I, uh, yesterday I was at, I was at uh, Lowe's, and I was going to check, and I, I forgot about it. I was going to see if they are all out of bidets. I was just curious. Like, you know, like, are people, uh, they, they go into that extreme of like, well, they're going to be out of toilet paper. We've got to put this in our house. I don't. Anyways, I was curious. And now you are too. But anyways, <laughs> we value others. I hope that as, as, as opportunities arise, you take the opportunity to love others selflessly. Last night, I, I uh, was... Going around uh, the store, I had realized we were low on baby wipes. I wasn't looking to stock up with five years' worth of baby wipes, okay? I was just looking to get, like, one package of them. I couldn't find them anywhere. 
I mean, I, I tried a whole bunch of stores. Finally, I found one package like tucked behind a bunch of stuff on a, on a shelf. And I, I don't know if somebody was like saving them for later or I don't, I don't know, I don't know, whatever. But I, I, I grabbed them. But I tell you what it made me think of. The reality is some people are going to have some real needs that may be something as simple as baby wipes, but when you got little kids in diapers, that's kind of a necessity, right? It's really helpful to have those around. I hope that we're the individuals that come to people's uh, side and help them and encourage them with these things that might seem trivial and might seem small, but let me tell you, it'll encourage people in a big way. I had somebody that come up to me after the first service this morning and said, you know what, if you know of needs that are going on, we, we want to help. We want to jump in. God's blessed us with an opportunity and we want to be a blessing to others. So if you know of things, please call us. That should be all of our response. There's the reality that if, as of last night, school was still open tomorrow. Okay, now it could change in the next how many hours here, but if schools end up closing over the next month, I, I'm telling you there's single parents that are going to need some help. There, there's families where both parents work and child care is going to be an issue. I, I hope that if you know somebody like that, that you can step in and help them. My wife said to me, you know, what if we went around to our neighbors if that happened and just said, hey, just so you know, we're willing to help out. And we said we'd take one of our sweet children with us. So we'll see who's having a good day. But um, no, it's just the reality of like, there could be some needs that people have that we can just step in and fill. And, and quite honestly, it's not that hard. But it, I'll tell you exactly what it'll do. It'll point people to Jesus Christ. And these little things and little opportunities that we have are going to be a big deal to some people. We want to be a church that runs to help, not goes into hiding. Why? Because we value others. We're going to model the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said in Luke chapter 3 and verse 11, he said, whoever has two tunics, a coat, right? We'd consider it a coat. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Go into the freezer section in a store right now. It's empty, right? Vegetables. I, I went to pick up a few frozen vegetables the other day, and there's nothing there. Whoever has, right, should share. If you're out of some basic goods and, and you have some needs, we want you to tell us, okay? Okay. Because there's people sitting around you that want to come alongside of you and help. And if you know others within the community that there's needs, please tell us we want to be the ones to rise up and help. And we want to be the ones to point people to Jesus Christ with how we respond. Jesus said in, in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, 37, he says to this lawyer, he says, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We value God's word. We value others. Our third value is that we value worship. Therefore, we seek to exalt God in all aspects of our lives. One of the greatest ways to respond to fear is with worship. There's, I, I'm just straightforward with you. There, there's been times this week where as I hear news and all these things, I've had to just shut it off. And, and when I've shut it off, I've intentionally listened to Christian music. And I've intentionally been in God's Word because that's what needs to shape my thinking. And when we are drawn to fear and when we are led to consider doubt and worry, we need to respond with worship. That's what we talked about earlier. Don't be anxious. Pray. Don't fear. Worship. I listened to uh, Family Life Network on 88 or uh, 89.5 this week a couple of times. 
And, and I think they were very intentional with some of the songs that they were picking. All week long, it just seemed like they were really intentional with making sure that they were picking songs that really spoke to the greatness of who God is and that we don't need to fear, we don't need to worry because we can trust in God. And those lyrics helped shape our perspective and point us back to God, helping us embrace the reality that none of this is a surprise to Him. In Joshua chapter 1, Moses, the great leader of Israel, has just died. Joshua's now thrown into the driver's seat. He's supposed to take the people of Israel into the promised land. He's supposed to take them into unknown territory. And God says this to him in Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. And do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go, don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. Uh, the final night before Jesus was go to, to go to the cross, he was with his disciples, and he told his disciples this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He, he's communicating to a group of guys that he knows are about to be bombarded with some difficulties. They're about to go into hiding. They're about to, to, uh, to run in fear. And he says, listen, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and self-control. Three different times in Psalm 37, David says this, Fret not. And when he says to fret not, the reason is God. We, we don't fret because we trust in the Lord. He's our God. He's our stronghold. He's our refuge. He's our deliverer. And our values of God's word of others and of worship will shape our perspective. And they'll shape our reaction. And when we respond in these ways, it will point to our undeniable God. As we sang earlier, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. He is higher than any other. He's the healer. He's awesome in power, and He is our God. So big picture, God is sovereign. And we trust in His sovereignty. We trust in God's Word, and we will love others selflessly. Why? Because we value others. You know, some people look at everything that's going on, they're very, very, very fearful. And they're very scared, and they're very concerned. And where some people only see obstacles, we can find opportunities. This whole scenario that's going on in our country and in our world is a great bridge into 1 Peter this morning. And I want to spend just a few minutes just going a little bit further in our study it's a great bridge because God is on the throne. He's sovereign. And He can use tough situations to draw people to Himself. Uh, this week we had a staff meeting and we were already talking about the fact that we might have to make some adjustments for this weekend. And, uh, and I'll just tell you, if we are going to make some more adjustments uh, for next week, we will let you know. We'll keep you informed as we have already um, for today. But we're going to continue to just make changes that we need to make as we move forward, but as we talked about what was going on, one of our staff members was telling us about how the effect of coronavirus has opened up some incredible opportunities for those who are followers of Christ in China. There's all kinds of fear and doubt and worry right in China, and, and it's kind of exploded on the scene there in China, and Christians have taken these opportunities to share the love of Christ with those who are around them. And it's been a great opportunity for them. God's using it in an incredible way. And when we live with the perspective of God in control, we can live out an undeniable peace in the face of adversity. Last week we looked at 1 Peter 1.13 and we noted this. Setting our hope on heaven changes our perspective on earth. We're going to continue in 1 Peter chapter 1, and it's on page 588 if you're using one of the Bibles around you. 
But we've been going through this letter that Peter wrote to the churches of what is now modern-day Turkey. And at the time, they're going through trials. They're going through tough times. They were going through uh, trials and sufferings in these, in these challenging times were, I'm sure, somewhat similar to ours. And Peter tells them this. We looked at this last week in verse 13. Therefore, because of the hope that we have in Christ, and because we face trials and adversity, prepare your minds for action. And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We will go through trials and struggles in life. Plan on it. And so when we are facing those in the reality that those tough times may come, we need to prepare our minds for those times. We need to prepare our minds for action. We do it by diving into God's Word and allowing His truth to shape our perspective. We looked at Romans 12, 2 last week that says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Isn't that what we're looking for? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. When we dive into God's Word, it transforms our perspective, the way we think, the way we act. And Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Then he goes on and says this, be sober-minded. We need to think clearly about what goes on around us. And in, and in the times ahead of us right now, we need to not base our actions on emotions and fear, but on truth. We said this, you can't choose how you feel, but you can choose what you think about. And when you choose what you think about, it can change how you feel. When we are in God's Word and we base our thinking on this book, it changes the way we see things. It changes those emotions. It changes those fears and concerns, which is why Peter goes on to say this, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. When we set our hope on heaven, it changes our perspective here on earth. Peter goes on now in verse 14, and we're going to look at verse 14, 15, and 16 just real quickly this morning. And he says this, As obedient children, do not be conformed to to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He starts out this phrase and says, as obedient children, as those who, just like we, we expect kids to obey mom and dad, right? As those who are followers of Christ, who, who claim to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, don't, be, don't do things the way you used to. When you become a follower of Christ, there's a dr dramatic change that takes place in your life. And the idea here, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, your former way of life. But be holy, is what he's about to tell us. We, we know, we understand, we get it. And here Peter wants to warn them to not get caught up in the old life. Don't get caught up in the old way of living and thinking. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. When we choose to surrender our life to God and give it to Him, all right, God, I'm done doing things my way. I'm going to follow you. When we choose to do that and we choose to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, verse 18, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. It all happens because God sent his son Jesus Christ to the cross to pay for our sin, and he has reconciled us to himself because of that. And when we give our life to Christ, we are a new creation. We're done with the old way of life. The new is coming. It's way better. Paul also says this in Colossians 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He says this. I love verse 2. It's a, it's a familiar verse to some. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Our perspective is shaped by heavenly things. It's shaped by God who is on the throne. And as followers of Christ, when we become followers of Christ, we need to set our mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. 
Verse 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he says this in verse 5, put to death, therefore, because of this perspective, because we've set our mind on heavenly things, put to death, therefore, what is, the earth, what is earthly in you. Well, what's earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, like before we became followers of Christ. We once lived that way when you were living in them. But now you must put away them all. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. When we become a follower of Jesus, we stop doing life the old way and we put on the new life, life in Christ. And we begin to uh, be more, we're more renewed into the image of our creator. We're made into the image of God. You know, the more that you follow God, the more you become like who you follow, right? Um, our, our youngest, Jackson, um, turned two in February last month, and uh, he's at that age where he, he loves to go around and follow dad and mom around. And I, I love this age because you can almost do no wrong in their minds, right? Um, they haven't figured out yet that, that we make mistakes too. But I, I love it. He follows me around, and there's times where I'm working on different things, and he wants to see what I'm doing. And he wants to, if he can grab a tool, he wants to grab a tool. And he wants to pretend like he's fixing something, and he's working on something. I love it. It's, it's an awesome time. And he's really just in awe and enamored by, especially mom, but sometimes dad too, right? I love it. Listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, that's what we need to be like. We need to be enamored with who God is, in awe of who he is. And the more that we follow him and the more that we keep our eyes on him, he transforms our way of thinking and our way of acting and our way of living. Talk about a change in perspective. The difference in Christ, of life in Christ, is undeniable. Why? Because Christ lives within us. Our bodies are the temple of God's Spirit that dwells with inside of us. And we're being renewed in the image of our Creator. With this in mind, look back at what Peter says in verse 14, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance the way you used to live. But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. All of us, self-included, right, have areas that it's easy to overlook. Peter makes it really clear, all our conduct. Why? Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. At the heart of Christ's likeness, of being like Jesus Christ, is holiness. Peter here quotes the Old Testament book of Leviticus in this phrase, you shall be holy for I am holy, is, is a number of times throughout the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus gives a number of instructions, but at the heart of it is holiness. Holiness is, is being set apart from what is common. And just as Israel was to be set apart from all the nations that surrounded them, we're to be set apart, right? Um, as, as Israel left Egypt and they're going to go into the promised land, Life, the way they did it, was very different. And the way God wanted them to live was very, very, very different from everything around them. The nations that surrounded them were nations that had multiple gods, right? I mean, in, in those days, there was multiple, many, 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 many different gods. And they had different images or idols uh, that represented these gods. And they would worship these things. And God says, listen, very clearly, you're going to have none besides me, and you're not going to have any images. He says that right at the beginning of the Ten Commandments. And so that alone really pointed to just this great difference that was going to be the way they lived as a people group, as a nation, that they're going to be way different from everybody around them. Listen, the same is true for us today. The way we do life when we follow Jesus is very different from those around us. And so as we see people around us 
who are captured with fear. We need to be caught up in the peace of God that passes all understanding. We need to point to the sovereignty of God, that He is on the throne and He is in control. Peter makes it clear, we're no longer going to pursue our former passions. We're going to pursue holiness. We're going to desire to be like Jesus. We, we want to follow our, our leader. And we want to be more and more like him every day. And we don't do this. Listen, we don't make, do this to make ourselves look good. We pursue holiness to bring God glory. Not ourselves. Not about us at all. It's about him and what he's done in us and through us. As God uh, is called holy, he, He's totally set apart from everything. Uh, he is totally different. He's completely distinct and unique. He's entirely other. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is given this glimpse into the throne room of heaven, and as he's there in the throne room of heaven, the angels proclaim this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And when Isaiah has this glimpse of God in all of his glory and all his splendor and majesty, he's totally undone. He's completely in awe and enamored with God. He totally recognizes that God is in a category of his own and he really has no business being in God's presence. And the reality is we don't either, except for God sent his son to die for us, to pay the penalty for our sin. And God sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what allows us to, as the writer of Hebrews says, boldly approach God's throne and seek grace and mercy in time of need. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. In verses 13 through 16 of 1 Peter 1 here, there's two commands. Have hope and be holy. We've looked at these passages the last two weeks, verse 13 through 16. There's two commands. Have hope and be holy. And when we embrace the hope that we have in Christ and pursue holiness, our perspective will drastically change and the change will be undeniable, not because of us, but because of Christ in us. This past week has been a bit hectic. It's been a little crazy to say the least. And I anticipate that this week is probably going to be more of the same. But as we face uncertainty in this life, we need to remember the certainty of heaven. The fulfillment of and completion of our hope that is what keeps things in perspective. This world is not our home. I want to encourage you today, don't fear. Don't worry. Don't be anxious, but instead pray. Respond with our value of worship, that we value worship. Therefore, we're going to exalt God in all aspects of life. Everything, with everything that comes our way. In considering our response to trials and difficulties, there was a number of times throughout this week where I kept coming across the same passage of Scripture. And I think I heard it once on a, on a video that I saw online um, I, I think I actually was at my sister's house and her Bible was opened up to this passage. Um, I, I, I came across it in my own reading this week and it kept popping up time and time again. And when something like that keeps happening, listen, pay attention, all right? And, and, I, and I stopped and I read the chapter. I read Psalm 46. And I, and I want to read it for you this morning because I want you to recognize the perspective that we can have when we ground ourselves in God's Word. Not in what media has to say. Not in what the latest social media posts have to say. Not in what the news has to say. But what God's Word has to say. 
And so I want to read this to you. And I want you to just stop right where you're at and just listen. And allow the power and authority of God's Word to shape your perspective. Psalm 46, verse 1 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God, He is our refuge and strength. He's the help in trouble. And because of that, therefore, verse 2, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose, stream, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Listen, the, the nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then in the midst of this chapter, God says this, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. It's God's, it's God's word that needs to shape our perspective as we move forward in the days ahead. And as we think about all that's taking place, what we know is this. God is sovereign and worry never helps. And what we will do is we will trust God fully and we will love others selflessly. We have a great opportunity that lies before us, church. Let's rise up and be the church. Not just do church on Sundays, but be the church. If you know of those who have needs, and maybe you're someone that has needs, we want to be the ones to rise up and help. Let us know. Tell us. Maybe it's neighbors that you know. Maybe it's a coworker. Whatever the situation is, we want to rise up and help. And we're going to rest in God's sovereignty. We're going to be still and know that He is God, that He is going to be exalted in all the earth, among all the nations. If you're not a follower of Christ this morning, I hope you see the difference of God in someone's life. Because the difference is undeniable. Our perspective in Christ is entirely different. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you're listening online, and you recognize, you know what? I don't want to keep doing life my way. I'm tired of it. It doesn't work. I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to continue to have the struggles that I have. We would encourage you today to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says this, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we want to encourage you to ask Jesus to be the leader of your life, the forgiver of your sin, that you'd turn from your way of living that you'd repent of sin and follow Jesus. And can I tell you, the perspective, the change in your life will be undeniable because our God is greater. Our God is stronger. He's higher than any other. He's healer. He's awesome in power. He is our God. Lord, we come before you today so, so thankful for perspective in Christ. And Lord, certainly there are legitimate concerns and fears. Help us not to overreact and help us not to underreact. And God, help our perspective to be shaped by your character and your word. 
Help us to hold tightly to our values of what we've claimed as a church is important to us and help that to shape our behavior as we move forward. God, we're asking that you would use us. Use this church to be a light in our community. God, we ask and pray that you would help us to be uh, encouragers to those who are around us. Help us to be people that uh, takes the fears and the anxiety that we have and that we would go to our knees and cast our cares on you because you care for us. Help us to be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Help us to be bold for your name's sake. God, we, we know that at some point this is all going to pass. But in the meantime, we're praying that you would use us. That as followers of Christ, and as a body of Christ, as your church, that we would rise up because you are greater. God, we are so thankful for perspective in Christ. God, help us to rest in your promises and to hold tightly to your truth and to trust you with each day moving forward. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,